Hello and welcome to another English language A-level video. This one is about children's phonological development. So here we go and let's start off with some research. Burko and Brown, our old friends. Burko, she of the WUG test. Brown, he of the, amongst other things, two word utterances. And this is their this phenomenon. Du, 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 du. Now, what is this? Well, a child referred to his plastic fish as a fiss. So when an adult asked, is this your fiss? The child said, no, it was his fiss. And when the adult then asked, ah, is this your fish? The, the child replied, yes, that's my fiss. <laughs> so what does the fiss phenomenon suggest in terms of theories of language acquisition? Have a think. So, for my money, this is all about the gap that exists between children's understanding of phonology and their ability to articulate certain phonemes. There's a gap, you see, because this child can clearly hear the difference between a s and ch phoneme. It's just that they are unable to articulate them differently. Okay, so this is the FIS phenomenon. So look out for this when you're looking at CLD transcripts. Uh, and maybe looking in your language investigations as well. Look out for evidence that the child is simply unable to articulate certain phonemes, even though they show understanding of what those phonemes are. Burko and Brown's FIS phenomenon. Now, let's think more broadly about phonology. How many sounds are there in the English language if we're speaking standard English RP? The answer is, well, 44. 44 sounds of English. They can be divided, of course, into vowels and consonants. So here, let's have a look at the vowel sounds. There are 20 of them, but in fact, there are 12 symbols and eight of them, which are some things called diphthongs, which I'll explain in a few minutes. So here they are. Here are the 12 vowel monophthongs of English. And you'll see that some of them have got colons after it. So the ones that have colons after them, there are five of them, those are long English vowels. So we're talking about sheep. So these are the IPA symbols. So sheep is an I with a colon after it. U is a U with a colon after it. Er, as in bird, is like a capital E back to front with a colon after it. Or is a C back to front with a colon after it. And R is a conventional A with a colon after it. So five vowel monophthongs of English. And then you've got your short vowels. So you've got I, which looks like a capital I. You've got this, so U, which looks like a vase, I suppose. We've got E, which is a conventional E. We've got this one, which is the most common sound in English. It's the schwa sound, S-C-H-W-A. The schwa sound, uh, it's an unstressed uh phony. So an upside down E is the schwa sound, uh. What else have we got in terms of short vowels? We've got this one, so an A and an E conjoined is the a uh phony. This is one of the oldest symbols in English. Go back to 8th century versions of the Lord's Prayer. Ura fader, fader. So you're going to see that as the first vowel of fader. So a, ah, it's a conjoined a and an e. We've got a, uh, which is an upside down v. And then we've got o, uh, which is a back to front a. So those are the 12 monothongs of English. We have eight diphthongs, lovely word. A diphthong is two monothongs conjoined. So if you take the word boy, for example, the oi vowel in there is actually two monothongs conjoined. It's that one, the o one, and i, that one. And if you say them together quickly, you get boy. So they are diphthongs. Okay, so most children will be able to use all of the vowels in English by the time that they're two and a half years old, which is pretty miraculous. I mean, I suppose uh, vowels are easier to produce than uh, consonant sounds. 
Uh, there's no fancy tricks going on with vowels. No, you, there's nothing very much that you're doing with your teeth or your tongue or your lips. You're basically projecting air from the back of your throat. So different to uh, consonants. Now then, what do you like on remembering those IPA symbols? Could you do this? Number one, bat. Number two, bit. Number three, bar. Number four, bore. Number five, bet. Number six, beat. Number seven, bun. Number eight, boot. Number nine, river. And number ten, book. Right, how did you get on? Your bat, that's that one that I said came from Old English. So that's the A and the E joined together. Bit is easy because it's just a capital I. R is an A, a lowercase a, with a colon after it. Or is your back to front C with a colon after it. E is E. E is a capital I with a colon after it. Bun is an overturned V. Boot is a U with a colon after it. And then your river is your schwa sound, so that's the unstressed vowel sound. It's a upside down E. And last, but by no means least, you've got O, which is, of course, looks a bit like a vase, so a U with a fancy lips to it. OK, so in the AQA exam, you are going to get a table with the IPA symbols on it. It's just that it's massively going to save you time if you learn some of these symbols now, difficult though they might seem to you. Let's move on to consonants. There are 24 of them in English. Uh, some of these terms you surely don't need, like you don't need those over there. Um, some of them it's quite useful to know. This column here, these are stopped or plosive sounds. They're little explosions of sound that you're doing with your mouth to produce those particular phonemes. So that's the manner of how you're doing it. You are exploding sounds. And over here, it's showing you which place in the mouth these sounds are coming from. And over on the left hand side, that's from the front of your mouth. And over there on the right hand side, that's from the back of your mouth. So if we think about P and B, both of those are bilabial plosive sounds. Bilabial because you're producing it through both of your lips. Uh, T and D are alveolar plosive sounds. T and D. Alveolar is the roof of your mouth. So you're forming that sound by putting the tip of your tongue on the top of the roof of your mouth. T and D. And then if you go even further back in your mouth, you've got your K and your G, which is the back of your throat. That's your velar. So those are velar plosive sounds. And you might be intrigued to see what this question mark is. Well, that's your glottal stop. So that's where estuary English speakers are saying things like bottle rather than bottle. So they are substituting a kind of a breathy H sound from the back of the mouth for what well, in RP would be a T phoneme. So P, B, T, D, K, G are all plosive sounds. Generally, they are easier to produce for children than these lot over here, which are fricative sounds, so-called fricative because they are produced uh, produced through friction. So you've got f and v. Both of those are labiodental fricatives. Think about it, labiodental. F, v, you're resting your tooth on your bottom lip, aren't you? So that makes them labiodental phonemes. These ones are interesting. Those are the equivalent of th sounds. So the funny, the top one, which is a circle with a line going through, that's a, that's a th, as in theater. And the bottom one, which is like a D with a hook through it, is a v, as in the definite article, the. So the theater, those are interdental fricative sounds. And then as you move further back through the mouth, you've got alveolar fricatives, s and z. You've got palatal fricatives, which are sh and j. And then you've got lurking right at the back there, you've got a h sound, which is a glottal fricative. And even more difficult for children to articulate are these affricate phonemes, because you've got ch, as in the word church, 
So church has got two affricate palatal sounds. And then you've got J, which is like a D and a Z put together, which is an affricate, voiced affricate, palatal sound. Those are the main ones for you to be remembering. It's quite useful sometimes to be able to call some phonemes uh, nasal ones. So M is a bilabial nasal phoneme. N is a uh, alveolar nasal phoneme. And what about this one here? This is the velar nasal phoneme. So when you're forming the progressive aspect of a verb, like walking, for example, the ing sound there, if you're pronouncing that in standard English, that's a velar nasal phoneme. Okay, so those are the main ones to remember. The key things to remember here are bilabial and labiodental, they're from the front of the mouth, and these are stopped sounds which are easier to articulate than fricative or affricate phonemes. There are various videos on YouTube that take you through these things, but here are the key things that you need to remember. Children essentially learn vowels and consonants at different speeds, so they learn to use some phonemes earlier than others. Most children by the age of two and a half, as we've said before, they'll be able to use all of the 20 vowels in English by the time they reach that age. But consonants are a different matter because children might not be able to use all the consonants confidently until they're as old as six or seven years old. And the earliest consonants they tend to master come from the front of the mouth. They tend to be those bilabial phonemes like m and n. So these are nasals. And then you've got your p and your b, known as plosives. That may be because children enjoy the the fun of making those little explosions of sound. It may be about behaviorism because there you've got a child concentrating on an adult's face and they can see physically how some of the phonemes are being articulated. And maybe that's why when they do their reduplicated babbling, ba 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 mama, it tends to be those bilabial phonemes that the child can actually see in the adult's mouth. The last ones, the last phonemes that the children tend to articulate are those th ones. They're tricky, aren't they? So you've got the, the th sound as in thought, and then you've got the th sound as in this. And then there are other sounds known as fricative phonemes. So your s and your z and your l. And remember, they come from further back in the mouth. So Basically, the further back in the mouth the sound comes from, the later that tends to come into the child's repertoire. Children find using consonants at the beginnings of the words, that's the initial position, easier than consonants at the ends of the words, and that's the terminal position. So, for example, they'll find it easier to say the t in teddy than the t as in sit. OK, but that's pretty much like adults because lots of adult allied sounds, don't they? And there are plenty of us that when we are speaking to each other as adults, we're going to be missing out some of the consonants on the ends of words. Sit, sit down, will you? Uh, here are, this is directly taken from the AQA textbook. So these are the groups of phonemes ordered developmentally. Here are your early eight consonants. These are the sorts of sounds that you're hearing early on in a child's repertoire. Those aforementioned bilabial sounds like m, m b, p. You've got other plosive sounds like d. You've got y, you've got w, you've got h. Those are usually by the age of three, those are the phonemes that a child is quite literally able to get there lips round, whereas the middle eight, which come by about four or five years old, tend to be these ones. You've got t, you've got that velar nasal sound, the ng sound, you've got k, g, f, v, ch, and j. So those tend to come by the age of four or five. And then you've got these later ones, like the sh, and the z, s, z, r, and j. 
So the ones that basically have more friction going on in the mouth, they tend to come later on. And as I said, it may not be until the child reaches something like six or seven years old that they're able to master these particular consonant phonemes. Now, of course, there are some phonological patterns in children's speech, and it tends to be different from RP. And here are some of the main features. So quite often in children's speech, you get addition. And the classic one is, of course, the diminutive form, where a child doesn't say the word dog, but they say doggy. So quite often you have additional sounds being added to words. The opposite of that, of course, is deletion. And just as I've said, you know, lots of adults tend to delete sounds from the back of words. Children do the same. So do instead of dog and k instead of cup. We also have substitution because if you're struggling to do your th or th sound, then the best thing to do is to do a substitution, isn't it? So dat for that. So in this case, a plosive sound is replacing the standard English RP um, fricative phoneme. You've then got assimilation where you've got a, a mix up of the consonant sounds. So consonant sounds are sort of moved within a particular word. So you've got the word dog and the child calls the, the animal gog instead of dog because that gut sound is already existing in the word babbit instead of rabbit, gog instead of dog. So this is assimilation. You've also got a reduction in consonant clusters. I love consonant clusters. It sounds like some kind of fancy chocolate, doesn't it? Well, if you look in the initial position of this uh, common noun spider, sp, you've got two consonants rammed together there. So naturally the child is going to reduce and simplify. So they're reducing a consonant cluster and they're saying pida instead of spider. Children naturally tend to do reduplication. We've seen that through the course. We've looked at their children's first words, but we've also noticed that adults, when they're speaking with children using CDS, they also tend to reduplicate as well. And then finally, you've got another kind of deletion, and this is deletion of unstressed syllables. So take a polysyllabic word like banana. It's got three syllables in it, banana. So the stress there is on the second syllable. So you're noticing here how the first syllable is being omitted. So deletion of unstressed syllables. Be on your lookout when you're given transcripts for any examples here of these phonological patterns in children's speech. OK, so here we've got some data. Let's see if you've been paying attention. Uh, so comment on the children's phonology in the data below. We've got dats, a circle. We've got me want another busy. We've got a baby says boo to for button. We've got glue becomes goo. We've got a baby called Frances attempts to say her name. It comes out as sassy, sassy. And then finally, we've got wing a wing a roses. Are you able to identify how these are non-RP? Right, <clears throat> so let's go through them finally. So that's a circle. So this is a good example of substitution where the child has not articulated a, a fricative sound, which is more difficult to articulate, and has substituted it for a plosive stopped sound instead. That's a circle. Number two, me want another busy. Sounds like somebody from Liverpool. Me want another busy. So we've got the deletion of the unstressed syllable on another. So that's a trisyllabic word. And the initial position, uh, A, has been omitted. So we've got that. We've also got something going on with busy as well. So biscuit would be a consonant cluster. So that has been reduced. So we've got reduction of the consonant cluster, and we've also got the omission of the T, so we've got deletion of the T consonant at the end of the common noun. So as you can see, any one word might have a number of these different phonological features. We've got this baby saying boo to for button, so 
that's a good example of reduplication. The oo sound is being repeated, and you've also got the deletion of the terminal position consonant on the end. We've got goo instead of glue, which is another reduction of a consonant cluster in the initial position of this noun. And this baby called Francis, poor thing, saying sassy instead of Francis, well, that's a kind of uh, assimilation that you've got here because, because the name already contains these sibilant sounds, then the child has also put sibilant sound right at the beginning of their name in that initial position. Okay, so you've got a kind of assimilation going on and you've also got a deletion as well because that final s sound has been omitted. And what about number seven, wing a wing a woses? Isn't this again a classic case of substitution where that rhotic phoneme r sound is actually quite tricky for children to articulate and so it's substituted here for a more straightforward w sound. There's plenty in children's phonology for you to be picking out, plenty of patterns for you to be detecting. Um, it's a good area for you to be scoring marks on, on your CLD answers. Thanks very much.